Hello, everyone, and welcome tonight to the Sunday night service in the garage. This is the Edge of Eternity, Bill Cameron. I am Bill Cameron, and I'll be bringing you a message tonight right from the garage. So I hope you uh, will stick around and see what's happening here. Um, before we get started, I want to mention a couple of things real quick. Grizz's Garage. Grizz took a break for a little while. He's back, and he has got the best videos up. Grizz is a very cool man and a real gentleman. You got to get to see him and, and get to know him through his channel. I'll have his information in the description, so be sure and check him out. And one other thing, I have a poll up uh, on my community page, and I've had about 13 people answer it so far, but I'd like a lot more to go and check that out. And uh, it's asking, are you interested in the New World Order or the One World Government? And I just want to get your uh, your input there. It just takes a second to do that. So I'd really appreciate that if you could do that. Now, tonight, we are going to talk about a term that you may not have heard before. It's called Dakota Faith. Have you ever heard of Dakota Faith? I'm going to uh, describe it to you tonight, and um, you will uh, find out a lot more at the end, so stick around if you're not familiar with Dakota Faith. It's awesome, 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 awesome. I'm so excited about this service tonight. So without any further ado, let's pray and get right into the message. Father, I thank you for today and for giving us the opportunity to come together and look at the Bible Father, there are many countries around the world that won't even allow this, but we have that freedom still to this day, and I pray that we will be able to keep that freedom. Lord, uh, bless us. Bless me as I bring this message tonight on Dakota Faith. Um, I thank you so much for giving it to me, and I just ask that you would bless all those who hear it. Be with us, Father, as we gather together in your name. Amen. Okay. Now, uh, grab your Bibles. You're going to need them tonight. Now, and I want to warn you, I've got a lot of scripture listed up here, okay? We've got Ezekiel 36 through 39, Isaiah 17, 1, Revelation chapters 9 and 16, 1 John chapters 1 and 2, and Ephesians 6, 12. No, we're not reading all of those uh, chapters tonight, but I want you to have them ready and um, read them this week. Just take, you know, it, it would take you probably an hour at tops to read all of that. And, uh, Really great stuff, and it's going to apply to what we speak about tonight. So here we go. I had a young man contact me this week. This guy, uh, fantastic. I can't tell you how impressed I was with this young man. And um, he was asking me, first of all, what does the Bible say about Russia? Is there anything about Russia in the Bible? And, of course, I explained that... Uh, Russia has a very significant place in Bible prophecy and in the days to come. There's going to be a time when there's a battle called the War of Gog of Magog. And Magog is Russia and Gog is the leader. And we're seeing things develop today that we've never seen before with all of these countries that surround Israel coming together to form a coalition for the single purpose of wiping Israel off the face of the map. Um, and so, yes, Russia is going to be very involved in Bible prophecy. And I've got other messages and videos on that that you can check out if you'd like to. But um, I'm going to keep all of that pretty short tonight. But I'm, I'm describing this uh, conversation that I had. So a uh, country's going to lead, uh, Russia's going to lead this big uh, coalition of countries for an all-out attack on Israel. And the goal is to wipe them off the face of the earth. Um, I would encourage you to watch some Middle Eastern news and Russia news. Right now, the only thing that the media really talks about is Russia uh, and Ukraine. They're not really focusing on uh, Israel or the Middle East very much at all. I follow these countries um, and some very good uh, news outlets on them. This war that I just told you about, Gog and Magog, you can be, you can find it in Ezekiel chapter, actually 38 and 39, but 36 and 37 tell of the recent history of Israel and how um, Ezekiel was told by the Lord that 
Israel would become a great nation. You know, for 2,600 years, Israel was banished from their own land. Very few Jews were still in that land, and they were impoverished and just very, very poor um, and had almost nothing really to look forward to. But then Ezekiel shows, uh, God shows Ezekiel this vision of a valley full of dry bones, dead, dried out bones, look like, you know, they could never live again. But God miraculously restored the nation of Israel on May 14th, 1948, and made them into a sovereign state once again. And that those two chapters of Ezekiel 36 and 37 clearly lay that out. Now, what is so interesting about that? Of course, at the time, Nazi Germany wanted to banish uh, Israel from the face of the earth and all the Jews. Uh, they were a um, people that were below standard. They were, you know, damaged goods in his, in Hitler's opinion in the, and in Nazi Germany. And they just wanted to wipe them off the face of the earth. And they tried really hard and they did a lot of damage, but God brought them, the Jews, back to life right after World War II ended. That's amazing. You cannot defeat God's plan and his will. So make sure you read that, all, all of those chapters, 36 through 39, and you won't be disappointed. Really, really, really good. Um, so then, then this question came up as we were talking. How can we stop Russia from doing this? And we really can't stop Russia from doing this. And this is what I explained because it's in the Bible. It's written. If it's written and recorded and prophesied about in the Bible, it's as good as happened already. In God's eyes, it's happened. The plan is laid out and we see it developing before our eyes. So we have to understand that we cannot stop this war of Gog of Magog from happening. It will happen one day. It may be before the Lord calls us to be with him, or it may be after the Lord calls us to be with him, but it will be happening. So we have to understand that what God's word says is true. In all these prophecies that have been made through the years, so many of them already become true to every single detail that the Bible states. And so we really can't. Now, if we had a stronger... Um, uh, administration, you know, right now our, our administration is very weak and it's undone a lot of the things that made us strong over the previous administration. Um, if this country was to bring back another administration like we had before this one, we might be able to delay it. It might give the Lord pause to say, trying to do what is right again. And God may allow us to have more time to preach the gospel to more people so that more people can make a decision for him before he calls the church to be uh, in heaven. Now, so we've talked about that. We've talked about, you know, can we stop Russia? No, because God himself is the one who is going to draw Russia into Israel for this great battle. So 2,600 years, no land, no no. Israel and the Jews got their land back. Now that was, as I mentioned, it was right after World War II. And, um, just two weeks ago, the leader of Iran, his name is Ali Hosseini Kamani, made the statement that Israel would be removed from the face of the earth by 2028. Iran is working on the bomb, the nuclear bomb. I'm pretty sure they already have them. They have the materials. Uh, they're building up their armies. They're supplying uh, all of the their proxies, you know, Lebanon, Gaza, Syria, um, Turkey, Russia with weapons and weapons, you know, drones and and um, these precision guided missiles and all this. Why? To attack Israel. It's all happening right now. And if you follow Israel news in Middle Eastern news, you'll see it every day. Now, Iran uh, was formerly Persia. Uh, its, its name <clears throat> became Iran not all that long ago. And they are the former Persian uh, um, empire. And the Persians are mentioned in this Ezekiel 38 and 39 that I'd like you to read. So the next question was, so... What other prophecies have to take place before the Lord comes for us, before the Lord takes us to be in heaven with him, those who believe in him? And um, 
The short answer is really, as far as we understand today, there are no other prophecies that need to be fulfilled. The Lord has done everything he said he needed to do and wanted to have accomplished before Jesus Christ calls us to be with him. But there are two that may happen before or after. We just don't know. And, you know, we have an idea, but we don't know. Uh, the first one is um, the city of Damascus in Syria. Damascus, Syria is probably the oldest city on the face of the planet. And it has never been destroyed, never been displaced. Nothing has ever happened to it. It has been there forever. But this is what Isaiah 17.1 says, the prophecy against Damascus. See, Damascus will no longer be a city, but will become a heap of ruins. Now, as I've been watching the news in the Middle East, um, Damascus has been a target of Israel a lot because Iran tries to smuggle all of these weapons through Damascus, Syria, through the international airport and by truck and tra any way they can get it through there, mostly trucks and, uh, and by flying them in. Israel has such a strong, um, Mossad, which is like our FBI, and they just seem to know every single time one of those smugglers or smuggling planes come in and they destroy it. And a couple of times already, the uh, Damascus airport has been uh, destroyed or the runways destroyed and then they rebuild them and then they come in again and they get destroyed again. And and uh, uh, I, Israel is attacking caravans and trucks with uh, weapons on them. And we don't really know necessarily how many get through, but most of them have been destroyed. There are terrorist attacks taking place in Israel almost every single day. And uh, the world is already against Israel. The United Nations wants to uh, sanction Israel and do some things against Israel. Joe Biden, the president of the United States, one of our best allies, Israel, he is going against them. He wants to re-engage in the Iranian nuclear uh, talks. It's almost hard to believe, except the Bible tells us about it. And then we can say, well, I guess I understand. Now, the other one is this war of Gog and Magog. We discussed that already. Uh, that could happen either shortly before or shortly after the Lord calls the Christians to heaven to be with him. So we discussed that a little bit. And um, then that, that brought up the question about the Euphrates River. Um, in uh, Revelation chapter 16, verse 12, it says this, The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. Now, who are the kings of the east? Well, definitely China and probably also India. And they always skirmish and fight against each other, except now they're seeming to come together to form an alliance. Hmm. China is also talking very friendly with uh, Russia. And there's going to be another war at the very end of the Great Tribulation that Russia and China and India and all these other countries are going to come to fight the battle of Armageddon against God, and God will destroy them. But that's one of the things that's happening right now in Bible prophecy. If you've looked at the news, look at news on the Euphrates River. It's almost dried up today. And um, this young man brought up the... the uh, fact of these angels that are under the Euphrates, evil, evil demons that have been locked away uh, for, you know, a couple of thousand years now, and they have not been released, but they will be released at that time. And at that time, they will have the power to kill one third of the human race. Now, there's going to be a lot of other big judgments like this as well, but that is a very big one that gets talked about. And then also in Revelation uh, 9, verses 14 and 15, I urge you to write these verses down and go read them so you can follow up on the news that I'm telling you about and um, see how accurate the Bible is for the day that we are living in. It said to the sixth angel, last time it was the sixth angel with the bowl of wrath, this time it's the sixth angel uh, in the trumpet judgment saying, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates and the four angels who have been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. One 
third of mankind will die in this event. Just gone. You don't want to be here for this. Except Christ is your savior now, you will avoid all of these judgments that come upon the earth. Now, this little section here leads to the last part and the most important part of the conversation that we had. And uh, this was the question, if a person believes in God, but sins, will they go to heaven or hell? Wow. This is a young man asking these questions, okay? He is mature beyond his years. I can assure you, um, spectacular young man. I mean, I, I just, I'm so impressed by him. And, and I followed him and seen him, uh, over the last couple of years, you know, a fair amount doing certain things. And, uh, his dad is, and his mom are super proud of him. They have two other boys also. They are all very similar, high achievers and really great young men. You can tell when young men have had a Christian father in their life. Super family. Um, the question is so important, I can't overemphasize it. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer and you sin, are you still going to heaven? Now, what I did is I wanted to let the Bible answer this question because it's a very important question. And so here's what I offered. This is uh, from 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and it says this. This is John writing to us, and he's an old man now. And he is kind of, you know, being very um, sentimental, but at the same time passionate and uh, caring like a father would be. And he says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For the son of God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He's a loving God. And the apostle John is telling us about him here. And then in 1 John, the same apostle John, 1, nine, we hear this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I have a question for you. I have an important question for you. This young man is quite a young man with this wisdom to ask these questions. We need a million more of him. He asked this. He said, I have a question about killing and going to heaven. Does it count as killing if it's in war? Does it count as killing if it is in war? Wow. I want you to know that this young man whose name is Dakota. <laughs> Dakota, man, I'm really proud of you. And I just am so thankful to have gotten to know you. He has enlisted with the United States Marines. He has enlisted to serve uh, our country and to protect us. And he wants to understand what the Bible says now before he goes off on this adventure. And he didn't ask me, well, what happens if I get killed in war? No, if he was called into battle and had to take the life of the enemy, would he still be saved? Would he still go to heaven? And I said, absolutely, yes. Look at the wars and things that people fought for God in the Bible. And when you are out in battle, fighting for your country, you are there to save the lives of the innocent people that you have enlisted to protect. And that's a noble thing to do. And God honors that. And he expects that. And I'm so thankful for that question. And he wanted to know, not only would his salvation be secure, but what if someone that he has a confrontation with dies? What about their soul? Their soul is between them and God. We all have to take responsibility and accept the gift of salvation that God provides to us. And then um, my advice 
to Dakota is this, and it's the same advice I would give to you, and it's the same advice I was, would give to anybody, no matter what your occupation is, no matter what your future holds. Stay close to God. Keep Jesus with you. Have your Bible with you. You can take a little New Testament, keep it in your pocket. You can carry a Bible. There's, you can look at it on your cell phone. You can read it in any language or, or translation you want. The Bible is there for you. And we need to read it because it tells us about God and his love for us and his son, Jesus Christ, and what he did in order for us to be able to know him personally. And so don't let other distractions and things that the world offers pull you away from that. Trust in Jesus Christ. Stay close to God. Every day I have to pray and call out to God to help me and protect me and lead me and guide me. And we all need to do that. So I ask that of you. So I want to say this. Dakota asked some essential questions that we all should have the answers to. And he not only asked it on his own behalf, but he asked on behalf of many of his friends who have also enlisted in the Marines. This is fantastic. It's such a blessing. And Dakota, I want to say God bless you. Since we talked about this, I was on vacation. It's been on my mind ever since. And uh, he sent me a text saying, maybe you should do a service on this. I said, I'm going to, I will do that. And thank God. I'm going to leave you with this scripture verse. It's in Ephesians 6, chapter 12. I've used it a number of times in the last several weeks. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our fight is really against Satan. Our fight is against the one who wants to see our souls perish in hell and the demons that he has under his control. I want to ask you to trust Jesus Christ as your personal savior. What does that mean? It means believing that he is God's son and that he lived a sinless life. Believing that he gave his life on the cross as the atoning sacrifice for our sin, like I read just a few minutes ago. And he gave his life, shed his blood, was buried in a tomb, and then rose again on the third day, having victory over sin and death. That is the God who we serve. He rose from the dead. And likewise, we can do the same if we trust in him as our Lord and Savior. It's by faith that you believe that. It's it's not a certain words in, in a prayer that you, you believe this with your heart, with your whole heart. For the, with the heart, man believes, and with the mouth, confession is made. This is how we come to know Jesus Christ, by faith. Let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for Dakota and the questions and discussion we had. And I pray that everyone who hears this message tonight and in the days to come would ponder these questions and these scriptures and take to heart what the Bible says. And may many more come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. I love you, and I will talk to you soon. Good night.